Good morning, everybody. We're just going to give participants a few more minutes to start and we'll commence the session shortly. Good morning, everybody. I think in the interest of time, uh, I would recommend that we start. I know it's a public holiday in Kenya. And for those that have joined from Kenya on a, a public holiday, we really appreciate you taking the time. So good morning and good afternoon, good evening to all participants. I know for some people it's either extremely early or extremely late in the day, but appreciate you taking the time to join us. Welcome to Change Our Session at the first International Public Health Conference hosted by the Africa CDC. I'm Abida Williams, the Senior Director for Scientific Affairs at j, j Global Public Health. And today during our session, we're gonna discuss the latest data on our COVID-19 vaccine, and also explain to you how we will provide access in Africa through our partnerships. Our mission at j, j is to make relevant innovations that saves lives, cure patients, prevent diseases. But to make these innovations affordable, accessible for the world's most vulnerable and underserved populations. So today, as I mentioned, we're gonna cover our, um, I give you an update on our vaccine. If I can just move to the next slide to take us through the proposed agenda. 
Um, we have quite a lot of data to share and to make sure that we cover all the information, we've got a, a host of speakers that will take guide us through the data. First up is Kashmira. She will take us through the, the insights on the durability and single dose of our, uh, our J&J vaccine. Next, Ali Goke will explain boosting, which is recently there's been a lot of information and data uh, generated on boosting both for our vaccines and other vaccines. And then we'll hand over to Linda Arthur, will explain to you how we're looking at providing equitable access of our vaccine in lower and middle income countries. And this we are doing through partnerships. We will then save some time to, for some questions. And I do encourage you to please ask your questions in the Q&A function and not in the chat. We will be monitoring the Q&A section so we can address all your issues. Um, we will encourage uh, the, uh, the participants to please hold off until the end of the session that we can respond to all the questions. And then I'd like to hand over to Kashmira. Kashmira has woken up exceptionally early this morning to present this data to you. She's based in the US. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Kashmira to, to take us through the latest safety, uh, safety and efficacy data for our vaccine. Thanks, Kashmira. Thank you very much, Abira. Um, I hope everybody can, can hear me. So again, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to join this session. Um, next slide, please. Wonderful. Um, so, uh, you know, very quickly, uh, we'll try to give an overview of um, a general introduction to our vaccine, uh, some of our um, the vaccine development program that we've gone through with our vaccine um, and looking at the immunogenicity and efficacy of our single dose regimen. Uh, before I hand it over to my colleague, uh, Ola Goke, who will talk about the boosting. Um, and as Abida introduced, I didn't have a chance to quickly introduce myself. I'm uh, Kashmira Date. I'm the Global Medical Affairs Lead for Vaccines in J&J's Global Public Health Organization. So, uh, you know, just looking at um, our vaccine, before I go into the vaccine development plan, I'll just quickly mention that um, our vaccine is a recombinant replication incompetent adenovirus uh, platform vaccine, the AD26 um, vaccine. This has been approved by WHO uh, as part of the WHO emergency use listing and uh, recommended now by WHO as both a single dose and a two dose regimen that my colleague Ola Goke will talk about. Um, so in terms of our vaccine development program, uh, you know, just in a pandemic outbreak control setting, we accelerated very quickly uh, with, uh, you know, especially with rapidly emerging variants, um, our vaccine development program. It is important to note that uh, we are looking at it both from a, um, you know, overall prevention of symptomatic disease, as well as prevention of severe and critical COVID, especially when it comes to hospitalizations and, and deaths. So during the uh, vaccine development plan, we did have both a single dose, uh, which is our ensemble study, as well as a two dose placebo, placebo controlled efficacy trial, which is our ensemble two study, uh, which is aimed at looking at a two dose uh, regimen of our vaccine. Um, this is again aimed to generate data that could help drive decisions to maximize the health impact of COVID-19 vaccination programs, both considering uh, the benefits at a population level, as well as maximum protection at an individual level. So these pivotal phase three studies were conducted in multiple continents, enrolling diverse populations across the uh, across the globe as well as making sure that um, you know we were incorporating the emerging uh, variants of concerns uh, where the pandemic was surging now this information that was generated from both these trials is further complemented by data that continue to be generated through ongoing clinical and real world evidence studies so i'll provide a little bit of uh, information on that um, as well uh, we do Sorry, can you just? Um, there is again, you know, we will provide more information on the kinetics of the immune response as well as um, uh, effectiveness against variants of concern. 
as well as uh, looking at the Delta variant. Now, it is to be remembered that some of these studies were conducted during a time period when different variants of concern were emerging, including the Delta variant. Next slide. So this slide actually looks at some of the immune responses over time following our single dose um, regimens. As you can see here on the left side, it is among individuals that was 18, which were 18 to 55 years of age, as well as on the right, you can see how the immune responses have been among individuals over 65. And um, again, as you can see here, the antibody titers although they start off a little bit lower compared with some of the other vaccines, they have remained persistent um, across time in, in both of these cohorts. They do decline a little bit in the older age group, and we'll talk about that as well. Next slide. Now this slide, I mean, you know, again, uh, my apologies, it's a little bit difficult to see this, but what it indicates is that uh, these are the humoral and cellular immunity responses against the variants of concern that we saw uh, during these clinical trials. Again, as you can see, the both the binding as well as the neutralizing antibodies against the variant viruses were maintained. Um, so they start off lower, but are again maintained over time um, suggesting a maturity of the humoral immune response. On the right side, you can see here the cellular immune responses, which are again the CD8 and the CD4 responses. And um, while we know, again, these are uh, have uh, these uh, responses have been determined to be quite important when it comes to um, uh, understanding the severity and prevention of, of severe uh, COVID-19 disease that these immune responses have been pretty robust. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, I will talk about our ensemble uh, study, which looks at the single dose regimen. So, um, as, uh, you know, before we get into some of these details, again, just to remember that our ensemble study, the new analyses were performed. There was a cutoff date of uh, July 9th. Uh, the median follow-up was, was four months, but again, we do have the uh, immune responses now up to eight, eight months uh, of, um, of follow-up period. Now, during this observation period, the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection was highly variable both across regions and countries. So that is again to be remembered. And then new variant lineages that emerge over time, including the alpha, gamma, the delta variant, and um, some of the other variants of interest. Next slide. So the uh, the ensemble study again, you know, we um, it it did meet its its primary objectives, and uh, very quickly here it was um, again to indicate that we had a pretty high vaccine efficacy, so about seventy five percent overall was noted against severe critical COVID nineteen and the overall vaccine effectiveness against severe disease was maintained for at least six months. Um, and now we have data for durability of the immune response for over uh, eight months. Now this um, high vaccine efficacy against severe disease was uh, consistent across different countries. After two weeks of vaccination, the overall efficacy to prevent COVID-19 deaths was about 85%. Next, uh, next slide, please. So this is again the, uh, the graph that shows the uh, immune response over time. As I noted earlier, although the immune response, although the, it starts a little bit lower in terms of vaccine efficacy, it has been maintained consistently over, um, uh, over a six month duration of time. Next, next slide, please. Similarly, again, when you look at the moderate and severe uh, COVID-19, the vaccine efficacy has been maintained uh, quite a bit over time as well. Now you can see that there's a slight dip here. Um, and you know, again, all of the, the data are being, uh, uh, are being looked at, but um, that overall, you know, the, the vaccine efficacy against moderate to severe uh, COVID-19 has been maintained over time as well. Next slide. So 
So just again, you know, summarizing some of the data that we have here, the vaccine efficacy against the reference strain was about 72% and then 90% 90 um, at day after day 14 against severe disease. We did have some reduced efficacy, but again, um, as I mentioned earlier, it has been maintained um, across time as well. There is limited data that were available again for Delta, and I'll go into uh, some of these uh, some of these data. But based on again the moderate and severe disease cases that occurred more than six months after vaccination, there was no apparent um, uh, VE decline that was observed across uh, across again different countries. Next slide. So some of the real world, so these are the ensemble study data that we have, but again, looking at some of the real world effectiveness of, the, um, of our data, there was a large study that was conducted, um, uh, you know, again, uh, within the US here, looking at the, um, um, uh, the uh, you know, different uh, across US providers among inpatient, outpatient pharmacy and laboratory services. Uh, this was a sample size of about 390,500 uh, vaccinees, uh, and among those, um, uh, you know, uh, or vaccinees that received the J the J and J vaccine, against uh, about 1.2 million that were unvaccinated. Um, I'll look at the data again. I'll move in in the interest of time. Next slide, please. So when we look at the vaccine effectiveness from this real world um, evidence study, it showed that the vaccine effectiveness uh, against hospitalizations was very strong and stable month to month, including when the Delta variant emerged within the US and it was maintained over time. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in terms of, again, you can look here, uh, there are quite a few numbers here, but again, to highlight that some of these data highlight the um, what we saw from our ensemble study as well. So um, like I said, this was again, uh, you know, a cohort of about 350,000 uh, vaccinated individuals and 1.2 million unvaccinated individuals. And, um, you know, again, we highlight here some of the data analyses that were done, which looked at a two stage matching both by age, time, as well as uh, including by location and some of the comorbidity status. We did notice that the vaccine effectiveness was about 79% um, or so against any observed COVID-19 and, um, uh, you know, against um, uh, against 81% uh, against any uh, COVID-19 related hospitalization. And that was also consistent across the different age groups, as well as looking at some of the immunocompromised status um, individuals that we noted during this period. Next slide. This again summarizes some of the real world effectiveness studies in addition to the, uh, uh, you know, the, the US study as well as our ensemble studies that show um, the vaccine effectiveness, which is again consistent. And when you look at the numbers, it is quite consistent in terms of what has been observed across studies as well. Next slide. Now, this is a, a, a slide that was actually presented at the US ACIP meeting, the um, Immunization Advisory Committee uh, of the US that compared how the vaccine effectiveness um, was, was maintained across uh, you know, the different vaccines for a symptomatic infection. And this is again, during the pre-Delta period, as well as during a period when the Delta variant emerged. As you can see here for the J&J &J vaccine, although the vaccine effic effic efficacy um, started a little bit lower, it was actually maintained quite consistently over time, both during the pre-Delta as well as the Delta periods. And in fact, um, the vaccine effectiveness actually, or the vaccine efficacy increased over time in both of the periods. There was no clear Delta effect on vaccine efficacy that was observed. And so we feel pretty good about the fact that the vaccine efficacy was maintained across, um, across the uh, Delta period emergence as well. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So 
So in summary, again, um, you know, just to um, uh, highlight the data that I presented, the, the vaccine, the single dose uh, Janssen COVID-19 vaccine has consistently demonstrated strong and stable protection through six months against severe critical disease and uh, death. The immune responses were shown to be stable across eight months, uh, through eight months following vaccination. And although there was a slight decline in the neutralizing antibodies among the older age groups. The ensemble data confirmed that the efficacy of the single dose vaccine remained high, uh, both against severe critical disease as well as death, regardless of the variants that were encountered. And again, the uh, additional real world effect effectiveness studies confirmed the sustained vaccine effectiveness, both in areas and times where the, where the Delta variant emerged and became dominant. Durable immune responses uh, translated to durable protection against severe disease. And while I didn't uh, provide any of the um, data from the other sites as well, now we have data coming from, from South Africa that are also confirming these findings. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Ola Goke, who will talk about the, uh, the boosting um, for the vaccine as well. Thank you. Thanks, Kashmir. Kashmir, sorry, if uh, there's one question in the chat, if you don't mind trying to answer it. It was a question wanting to know if they, do we have any um, comparisons with our vaccine and Astra, AstraZeneca's vaccine? Yeah, thank you so much, Abida. And so um, there is actually some of these uh, data that are looking at, uh, I mean, there is no direct head-to-head -head comparison, but there are these boosting and heterologous studies that are now, now looking at, um, you know, whether the, the different vaccines can be used in, in uh, different regimens. There is the COVE-BOOST study that looked at um, some of the, um, you know, uh, effectiveness and, and actually the immune responses when you, um, when you use the different vaccines. But there is no direct head-to-head uh, -head comparison right now comparing the, uh, the, the different vaccines other than, than the COVID study that, that I just mentioned and some of the other heterologous studies that are coming out. Perfect. Kashmir, sorry, I've got another question if you don't mind answering it too. It says, while we're showing that the uh, efficacy is stable, the question is, do we have any data to show how vaccines is reducing transmissibility? So that's a great question. And, um, you know, right now, again, when we are looking at some of the, the symptomatic uh, disease, we are seeing some of those data also showing a reduction in symptomatic disease, although that is a little bit lower. Now, transmission is, is more tricky. Um, you know, there is, uh, again, we are looking at the data very closely, but when we look at some of these transmission dynamics across countries, that may be a little bit difficult to tease out. So um, it's, it's, you know, again, when we look at transmission uh, prevention, the efficacy against transmission, we don't have some of those numbers directly, but I think we can, uh, we can elude from the, the data that we have right now. Thank you very much, Kashmira. So I'm gonna hand over to Ali Gorky. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Abida. Thank you very much, um, Kashmira, for giving us that data. Now, um, with the emergence of new variants, of course, for various reasons due to vaccines, pressure, and still inequitable distribution of vaccines globally, we are now having more and more mutations. And then there's been some data that show that over a longer period of time, there were some, there was some dip in the um, neutralizing antibodies for for all the vaccines essentially, um, more pronounced with the mRNA virus, but also exists with the viral vector vaccines. There is a need to sustain the efficacy of all these vaccines. And that's why um, there's more and more calls for boosting. And in many countries, depending on the epidemiological situation, they are already mandated to boost the vaccine. So I'll now be presenting um, data for the homologous boosting of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccines. Um, this is a, a, an overview or a summary of what, what I'm going to be presenting. So we realized that um, more than people received in uh, the Janssen study. So this is our own randomized clinical trial. And then there are some other smaller studies that have also occurred, over 9,000 individuals. And the efficacy against symptomatic disease in the US increased to 94% after the boosting, and then 74% globally. 
And there was also complete protection against severe critical disease, meaning we didn't record any severe critical disease during the period of this trial. Um, booster was also found to be well tolerated and safe. And then there was a rapid increase in antibody titer as a result of giving a second dose. This reflects the anamnestic response consistent with the booster dose. There was also something interesting that we found given the booster at six months provided a 12-fold increase in antibody levels, uh, which was more potent than two months, even though both are the recommended types of uh, boosting for the Janssen vaccine. So our large randomized trial already had um, over 30,000 individuals in the placebo control trial across nine countries and three continents. Um, after the unblinding period following emergency use authorization, some individuals or the individuals in the placebo group were offered the vaccine uh, and then 53 received a boosted dose in a double blind study. 25% um, of the individuals who were evaluated for our study were above the age of 60, which are the um, most vulnerable population. And the median follow up for the study was 36 days. 29% um, had more, at least two months of follow up. So, this is the, uh, some interesting data that we found. Uh, following the primary dose, uh, the vaccine efficacy was about 70% after 28 days, but two months after receiving the primary dose, a booster dose reflected a 94% um, efficacy to our vaccine in the United States. Uh, globally, the numbers were slightly different because we had different variants during the during the study as well. Uh, boosting after two months increased the efficacy to 75%. Again, some variants, the alpha variants, 94%, which was predominant in the US, and then 63% to the mu variant as well. Um, for, as I said earlier, for severe COVID, we had complete protection. Uh, we didn't have enough data due to follow up for hospitalization and death, even though the trend appears to show that there was also improved um, efficacy after boosting for these two um, endpoints. So I'll now talk about the immunogenicity following the boosting at two months. Um, this was uh, evaluated using ELISA and other, me other methods at uh, compiling different studies together, not just our own study. And we found out that um, there was uh, amnestic response with increase in antibody titers. So um, this graph shows the fold increase in um, compared to three, the first pivotal study um, after two months of giving the booster dose, there was a 4.6-fold increase in antibody levels um, to the spike protein or spike uh, antibodies. And after three months, there was actually a 5.6-fold um, uh, increase in the antibody titers. But given the booster dose at six months after the primary dose, it showed a 12-fold increase in antibody titers. This is interesting because uh, uh, it gives us a, a wide range of time to uh, boost with the Janssen COVID um, vaccine, either at two months, even though it was more potent at six months. So I'll now present the safety results. Um, as uh, most of the results we uh, I'll be presenting here are the systemic responses, uh, local, local, Re uh, local reactions remain the same as the previous study that was used to achieve emergency use authorization. So I'll present that for um, the systemic results. And we have over 9,000 cumulative exposures to booster dose, which I'll be presenting about. This was how it was randomized. Um, so the reactogenicity after two months. So the columns, uh, the first graph on the left shows in individuals less than 60 years old. And then the one on the right shows individuals over 60 years old. And within each column, the bar on the left shows after the reactogenicity, after the primary dose, well, about the one after two months of boosting. And then if you can see the orange bars on top shows any grade three, um, responses or any grade three adverse event. Um, from the graph on the left, you can see that uh, for fatigue, headache, myalgia, fever, and nausea, after boosting, there was actually lower um, reports of all these systemic adverse events and even 
um, lower rates of grade three events also after the booster. This was also replicated in individuals who are um, above the age of 60. And in fact, it appeared like um, people above the age of 60 had less um, systemic uh, reactogenicity to the booster vaccines. Um, we uh, created some data from six months vaccination. Our own trial was after the double blind trial was after two months. So we created some additional data um, from six months vaccination, which is ongoing right now. Again, it's just like giving the booster dose after two months. The bars on the left shows the primary dose and then the bars on the right shows the secondary dose. And it appeared again that um, giving the booster dose showed less uh, systemic reactogenicity and even lower cases of um, grade three events, even though the numbers are quite small. So uh, ongoing randomized double blind trial is what I just talked about. And it's estimated uh, giving the vaccine at different doses. So we evaluated um, 127 participants and the dose level data remain blinded. However, no grade three systemic reactogenicity events have been reported so far. With regards to unsolicited adverse events, in terms of any adverse events whatsoever, there was numerically higher um, adverse events, which was primarily driven by um, fatigue and headache. However, when it comes to um, safety subsets, second dose it was, was similar, but a medically assisted adverse event, it was similar for group six, six 6.6 and 6.4 percent. Any severe or serious adverse events was also similar in both groups 0.7 percent and 0.9 percent. Non-COVID related, uh, uh, non-COVID related adverse events um, were also similar in both groups 0.6 and 0.7. With regards to deaths, there was four deaths in the ad 26 COVID group, but none of them were due to COVID related events, while six were in the placebo group deemed to be due to COVID-19. So we still do not have any reported COVID-related death in our clinical trial. Uh, with regards to adverse events of special interest, so there was some post-marketing data that suggested some um, numerically higher cases among viral vector vaccines. And one of them was the thrombo thrombotic thrombocytopenic syndrome. Um, in, the in the clinical trial of 3009, there were two cases of thrombosis, one in each group, and none of the two were considered to, to meet the TTS uh, criteria based on CDC. So as a result of these very low numbers, we decided to pull some post-marketing data from the AstraZeneca um, COVID-19 vaccine in the UK, which is also a viral vector-based um, um, vaccine. It's not exactly the same, but it's also viral vector-based. And following those one, there were 2.4 million people who received those one. And then, uh, 24.9 million people, and then those two 24 million people, uh, the estimated rates were 15.1 after per, per million, 15.1 cases per million after the dose one, and 1.9, which was a significant drop after uh, dose two. Uh, the case fatality was 17%, six, six deaths after dose one, and then um, six deaths after the second dose. Uh, but after thorough review, the UK government deemed that there was no indication of an increased risk of these events after the second dose in any age group whatsoever. So this gives us some reassurance that even when you receive a booster dose of the Janssen COVID vaccine, uh, there's no increase, there will likely not be any increased rate of TTS amongst the recipients. Some other adverse events of um, interest, um, these were curated here because there were some, um, there appeared to be some increased numbers during the pivotal trial. And during the booster dosing, there was no significant um, increase. Tinnitus, there was a numerical increase in number, but it was not um, in terms of proportions, they were similar across all. So for tinnitus, uh, glumbaris and convulsions uh, in both the placebo and the the intervention group, there were similar um, rates. Arthritis, for some reason, appeared to be higher um, after the booster dose. This was not reported in the pivotal clinical trial. However, these individuals were 
uh, it was due to was deemed due to increased number of individuals with the disease pre-existing conditions which flared up within 28 days but after 28 days of the booster dosing the numbers were the same or similar across both the placebo group as well as the intervention group with adcov2 um, vaccine so in uh, conclusions to the safety data local adverse events remain similar systemic a is appeared lower after the boosting at six months than in two months. There were no new safety signals, which is very good. Um, global surveillance suggests rare TTS events with viral vector vaccines are less frequent with second dose than compared to the first dose. Um, we are continuing ongoing planned um, post authorization studies. And then, uh, if anything, of course, we'll be updating. In conclusion, um, there was humoral responses, but it persisted in the Janssen vaccine, um, both cell-mediated and humoral um, immunity. The efficacy of, for symptomatic disease improved to 94% and 74% globally. Uh, complete protection against severe disease, it appeared, the booster dose appeared safe, and the data on homologous boosting is what has led the SAGE group of the WHO to um, remember can still give the booster dose either at two months or at six months. Um, but due to the inequitable distribution of the vaccines, uh, the single dose is still highly recommended or preferred option in difficult to reach areas and places where um, the vaccine has not been well distributed. You can still give the single dose. Um, this will help the wider coverage and more rapid coverage. This is verbatim from the SAGE recommendation from WHO. Uh, then, uh, as vaccine supplies and accessibility improve, countries should consider offering a second dose, beginning with the high priority individuals. And then the recommendation is either to give it a two dose, even though it appears like um, there's more immune response or uh, antibody titer was increased at um, six months compared to two months. The vaccine um, and related um, biologic product advisory committee also recommends. Uh, recommendation says that uh, available data support the safety and effectiveness of the Janssen COVID vaccine for use under emergency use authorization as a booster dose in individuals 18 years and older, at least six months after a single dose of, pri uh, of the primary vaccination. Uh, in summary, uh, the booster, the homologous booster optimizes immune response, it increases protection against symptomatic disease, it prepares for future variants and potentially could help reduce uh, transmission of the disease. We can either give it at six months or at two months, even though the booster dose uh, six months appears to have a higher um, antibody response. Now that we've talked about the durability of the vaccine and the booster, I'll be handing over to my colleague, Linda, to talk about how we are distributing the vaccines equitably in low and middle income countries through partnership. Thank you so much, Olagoke, for that introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, the COVID pandemic has transformed all our lives in ways that we could never have imagined. Um, it has actually limited the way people relate to each other and perform the most basic of everyday tasks. And just as we thought that we were getting on top of things, um, we've been hit with the Omicron variant. And I'm sure you will agree with me that it's been a very difficult two years for everyone globally. Good morning. My name is Linda Arthur, and I'm the Africa Implementation and Access Lead for Vaccines at Johnson & Johnson Global Public Health. And today, I'll be speaking about Johnson & Johnson's commitment to ensuring equitable access to the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine in lower middle income countries via strategic partner, partnerships, all contributing towards us um, global, uh, global partnerships ending the pandemic. You will agree with me that the, the pandemic remains a global, can you just stay on the other slide please? You agree with me that the pandemic re remains a global health crisis um, um, since um, since over the, the, the last two years. And we've witnessed the power of strategic partnerships um, in the response at every level from R&D 
to manufacturing, to regulatory, to policy, logistics, supply and delivery, medical services and management and care, program implementation, advocacy and education and more. Next slide, please. So um, in March 2020, our chairman, Alex Gorski, and chief executive officer said the following, and I quote, the world is facing an urgent public health crisis, and we are committed to doing our part to make COVID-19 vaccines available, affordable, globally as quickly as possible. And as the world's largest healthcare com company, we feel a deep responsibility to improve the health of people around the world every day. Johnson & Johnson is well positioned through our combination of scientific expertise, and you've, you've heard my colleagues speak, operational scale and financial strength to bring our resources in collaboration with others to accelerate the fight against the pandemic. Our commitment to collaboration and partnerships on the COVID-19 vaccine, COVID vaccine began in January 2020 when our organization was searching for a potential COVID-19 vaccine. Um, this was progressed from the beginning by, a part, by partnerships and collaborations with um, BADA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, and the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. We recognized very early on that we could deliver a game-changing solution, a single dose COVID-19 vaccine compatible with the existing cold chain in resource limited settings and effective against multiple variants as my colleagues have, have, have described. And so in partnership with the South Africa Medical Research Council, we launched the Sosunki clinical trial, which targeted approximately 500,000 healthcare workers in, in, in South Africa. And based on our commitments, we will be the largest provider of COVID vaccines in Africa. And the next slide um, will um, inform us how this will happen. So a total of 900 million vaccines will be allocated to lower middle income countries by the end of 2022 via two access channels. We are committed to ensuring global access of our COVID vaccine on a not-for-profit basis for emergency um, pandemic use. And then we have also committed to allocate 500 million doses via the, the, the Gavi COVAX facility and up to 400 million doses via the Africa Union um, Africa Vaccines Acquisition Trust Advanced Purchase Agreement. And so this too comes up to the 900 million I mentioned. So with re regulatory approvals of our vaccines, which are critical for access, we have been, um, we, we, we worked with WHO and our vaccine as was described was, was listed for emergency use um, in all countries uh, and for rollout in COVAX. And through the Africa um, Vaccines Acquisition Forum, again, a partnership and collaboration, we accelerated the process of national regulatory approvals um, in African member states. And our delivery of, the delivery of our vaccines via COVAX has also been through our partnership with Gavi and UNICEF. So on this particular slide, I'm speaking about the implementation of the Africa Union, Africa Vaccines Acquisition Trust of Advanced Purchase um, Agreement. This has been done by jo Johnson & Johnson, AVAT and its partners, namely the Africa CDC listed here, um, the Africa Medical Supplies Platform, the Africa Exim Bank, and UNICEF via um, an operations discussion platform. Um, and this is run by a tax, task team tasked to um, ensure the end-to-end -end logistics um, to deliver in a seamless way uh, our vaccines to member states and to the CARICOM countries by um, September 2022. Um, and each partner plays a critical role in this process. The AVAT is responsible for allocation of doses to country. Africa Exim Bank focuses on finance, um, facilitating payments for vaccines on behalf of Africa member states. The Africa Medical Supplies Platform 
is, is uh, responsible for demand generation and ensuring country readiness. We at Johnson & Johnson are responsible for supply forecasting, order management and delivery and stakeholder management. And UNICEF um, is responsible for order management and delivery. Africa CDC is responsible for country readiness and stakeholder management. And I must say that you know the partnership has worked so well um, so well that um, you know we managed to problem solve. We've faced some challenges along the way, but we've stuck together and we've we've overcome um, some of these challenges, and we continue to work through 2022. On the last slide, um, last but one slide. Sorry, um, this is highlighting the new manufacturing partnerships that Johnson and Johnson has forged to increase our manufacturing capabilities to serve global commu communications. So we have BioE in India and also Aspen Pharmacare in South Africa. And I'm pleased to say that we currently have a, in place a non-binding term sheet with Af Aspen. And once this agreement is finalized, our COVID vaccine will be the first COVID vaccine to be produced by uh, an African company in Africa for the populations of Africa. And this is a critically important step in ensuring access to our vaccines um, in, in Africa. If you don't mind moving to the last slide. So to conclude, um, partnerships are at the forefront of our enterprise's commitment to the UN sustainable goals. And we've done this from the start, like I said and collect, collective action through these partnerships is needed in the short, medium, and long term in, um, at the global, regional, and national level responses to the COVID pandemic. Um, with that, I will hand over to Abida um, to take us through that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Linda. So we're going to move to our polling questions and we would ask the participants, we'll give you a couple of minutes to finish, uh, just to complete the polling and then we'll move over to Q&A. There was one question and I think maybe before we do the polling, if I can ask you, the question was access in Kenya. There was a concern that we, you know, Kenya still does not have adequate access to our vaccine. Would you like to comment on that one? Um, so, um... Yes, I'd like to comment about that. Thank you, Abida. And we, we are facing this in a number of countries, but I must say that now um, access is pulling through. Um, we have been fortunate that um, in addition to the Africa uh, Union um, and COVAX APAs, uh, vaccines have been made available via um, USG donations and EU donations. So we, I think in the last um, week or so, Regero, maybe, I don't know whether you can put your, your mic on. We've had quite a few um, um, donations from um, 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 uh, of our vaccines in Kenya. I, I don't know that you can give us a number, um, um, Regero, but I must say that so far through the Africa Union channel, We've had um, 31.3 3, million doses delivered to 40, 41 countries. And um, we've also had 3.9 million doses um, through the, vaccine, the COVAX facility. And in 2022, this is gonna ramp up. Thanks, Linda. Ruggiero, can I ask you to make a comment, please? Yes, please. Um, so thank you very much, Linda. Thank you, Abida. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Regeru Jiroge Regeru. I'm the Implementation and Program Management Lead for Vaccines for Sub-Saharan Africa for the Global Public Health Organization. Um, so just to add on top of what Linda has just shared, speaking specifically to Kenya, um, as of yesterday, the 12th of December, as a whole, so not just J&J, &J, but all vaccines received, um, Kenya has received 23 million 279,820 vaccine doses. So as a country, um, Kenya is definitely in a much better situation with regard to supply, even to where we were even just a month ago. 
So indeed now, um, as, I'm where, as I'm sure the person who asked the question, because I see there a Kenyan has asked the question, the shift now very much becomes um, really focusing on how we get from vaccines to vaccination. Um, so really um, all about the efforts now of getting um, those jabs in arms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regeru. Over to you, Abida. I appreciate it. Thank you. So if I can ask the participants, we're going to put up some polling questions. If you could please respond and then we'll open the floor for, for, for additional questions. You can also type a question in the Q&A box. Yeah. So if I can ask you just to complete these um, five polling questions, we'll give you a minute or two and then we'll open to the Q&A either in the chat or, or in the Q&A function. Good. So can I move over to Q&A? And yeah, we're open to having other live question, uh, questions, um, either typed in the chat or Q&A, wherever you feel comfortable. There was one question which goes back to Access, Linda uh, and Ruggiero. It says how, the, and it's, it's more comment than a question, indicating you know the, the, the need for equitable access in Africa. I don't know if either, either of you would like yeah. to. Know. Comment. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that is definitely <laughs> what we are aiming for. And that's why we have this agreement we are putting in place with Aspen. And over, um, over 2022, more of our vaccines will pull through. We had a, an agreement to, with the, through our APAs to deliver certain amounts in 2021. And, and we will be progressing to, to make more of those vaccines come through in in 2022 and that's paramount to us as an organization you know we are the first organization to to have um, uh, our vaccines produced on the continent and we are progressing um, in a very um, rapid way to make sure that africans get our vaccines so thank you very much abida i think that that answers the question thanks linda kashmira um, if i can turn to you there's a question for you the question is is there evidence that the change of vaccine can provoke an immune response with long lived plasma cells amongst the vaccinees yeah thanks uh, thanks so much and and you know from uh, basically what we've been looking at, at at the different parameters of the immune response right so uh, I don't have the data right now to present on what it looks like uh, in terms of the plasma cell uh, specific responses. But when you look at the overall immune response, you know, we're looking at the entire continuum of, of what it looks at um, in not just in terms of antibodies and the CD4 cells, but the other uh, parameters of the immune response as well. So I don't have the data to present exactly right now what it looks at, but um, we are looking at all of those parameters as well. Thanks, Kashmira. Can I ask just to go to the next slide? There's some delegates that have asked for translations of the, the presentations or the question, and unfortunately, we haven't offered that. Um, but I see there's another question. The question goes about access again, and it says, in Kenya, the Ministry of Health um, is denying Kenyans access to services without having vaccination certificates. Now that's a quite a challenging question for our group to answer. And I think most countries um, are considering, considering vaccine mandates. Um, it's either government policy or, you know, it, it, it trying to encourage people to get vaccinated. Um, as an organization, I think, you know, we, it, 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 it is a company, a country and a policy decision to me to make. And in, we know many workplaces are also making that same decision. So, it's an evolving space. And Linda said, you know, every day you wake up in, within COVID, uh, a, a pandemic, something different changes. Um, so I agree, it, it, it is, it, um, it's not a, um, 
an easy question to answer, but we know a lot of countries are, are considering it. So we still have time and I would encourage you, um, you know, if there's any additional questions, um, please feel free to ask them. And what we will do is the sessions have been recorded. We will disseminate to the delegates that either have registered and attended uh, the session. Um, and obviously if there's any other questions after the session, please feel to, free to reach out to us and we will try to answer them. Um, we have a dedicated global contact center where these questions can be channeled through. And in all countries, we have tried to have a local contact number. So you're welcome to look at our global contact center where you can ask these questions. And for country specific, um, there are con local contact numbers that you could call the contact center should you have any further questions. I said to there's another question in the chat. And then, no, I think we've answered all the questions. So I, I know it's a busy day for everybody. I don't want to uh, drag the presentations out, but I just want to thank my uh, presenters, my colleagues that have either woken up very early, Kashmir, and again, thank you for, for, for doing that for us. It, it's, it's extremely early on your side of the wall. Thanks for getting up and presenting to us. And to my other colleagues, appreciate the time and the presentation. Uh, the comments in the chat have been very positive about the quality of our presentation. And we're hoping that in future we can do more of these uh, presentations. Um, I think you know, although we've only had 55 participants, we will do more of these uh, inf information sessions in the countries and regionally as the data is evolving and every day there's new publications, new information, new guidelines. So it'd be important for us to uh, re respond to that. Sorry, there's one question that just popped up and the question was, is there any gender differences in the side effects of J&J vaccines? Kashmira? Yes, um, thank you so much for that question, you know, and um, I didn't have a chance to go into a lot of the safety related data, although my colleague Ole Goke uh, did present some of the data from our clinical trials on, on, the, um, on the side effect profile. So as you know uh, that, you know, we have had some, some of these safety uh, signals that have come out for the vaccine. So when you look at the, uh, the issue of the uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome or the TTS one, which was one of the, um, uh, you know, side effects or one of the um, adverse events of interest that were linked with, with the vaccine. So that is where we do see, um, uh, you know, some gender differences. So overall, when you look at, and I was trying to pull out the numbers on that, when you look at the overall um, incidence of uh, the, the TTS um, uh, issue, so you know it's it's about uh, two or three million uh, per million uh, vaccinees, but there is that sort of gender difference there that we do see more of these cases, especially in the U.S. and and the European populations, where uh, that has been seen, that the uh, the adverse event is more common among women in uh, the younger sort of age group, and so uh, that is the primary difference that we see with, um, with uh, one of our adverse events that has been um, looked at pretty closely. Thanks, Kashmira. So that was our, the last question. Um, and I think we've answered hopefully all your questions. As I repeat, we do have a global contact center where you can ask questions, whether it's medical related information questions uh, to report any adverse events because vigilance is very important to us as an organization. So I'm going to close the session. And again, thank you for attending for those friends in Kenya that it is a public holiday. Thanks for taking the time to respond. Uh, sorry, there's one more question that keeps, come, keeps coming up. So um, the one question is, the AstraZeneca and j, &J vaccine are both viral vaccines. Why is j, &J Janssen's vaccine a single dose? So yeah, you know, I can I can take that uh, question and see what I can do to uh, to address, sure. especially for uh, for our vaccine. I I don't think I can comment on the uh, J and J's uh, on the um, AstraZeneca's vaccine development program per se. So for our vaccine, you know, as I mentioned earlier, 
that you know we did have both the um, looking at, at a single dose as well as a uh, two dose regimen in our initial vaccine development plan in our clinical development plan. So you know again looking at the urgency of uh, the need to get the vaccine out there for pandemic control, we looked at how a single dose would perform um, to, to prevent um, you know, any severe and so uh, multiple you know, outcomes of interest, but the primary outcome of interest in terms of uh, you know, prevention of severity of disease and death is where we looked at the, uh, the performance of our vaccine, the efficacy of our vaccine against those outcomes. And the initial data were very promising uh, looking at, uh, the, you know, uh, our single dose was, was shown to be quite efficacious in preventing some of those severe outcomes. And so that's why, you know, we, um, we have that sort of single dose profile, but also as, you know, my colleague Olagoke mentioned that we have a second dose that has now been recommended for the additional individual protection uh, so, you know, we are looking at both of these parameters, the population level protection, as well as the individual level protection against severe disease and severe outcomes. So that's, you know, that's, that's why we have both of these uh, regimens um, for our vaccine for, for different phases of the pandemic. Thanks, Kashmira. Sorry, Linda, there's one question back to you again. And the question is, when does j, &J plan to make access to um, the vaccines to the private sector in, in Kenya? So currently um, we have, we don't have plans for um, bilateral agreements with, um, with, with specific countries. Um, we are in the pandemic phase. We have to, we are working with governments and international organizations. And these governments are, uh, ensuring that all populations, public and private, uh, uh, um, ha are getting access to the these vaccines. Um, I'm sure that um, when we get to the, well, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm hopeful that when we get to the, the, the routine phase, maybe things will be different. But for now, our main focus is making sure that we use these channels um, through the advanced purchase agreements that we have and through the USG donations to get to all populations in country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda. Okay. I'm just gonna take a breath because every time I think the meeting is uh, almost done, we have another question. So let's just see if anything else pops up. So there is another question. And the question is, how thermostable can the vaccine be? Is your plan to deliver the vaccine outside the bigger city centers? So that's uh, maybe Linda, either yourself or Rogero could answer that question. Um, I, I can take a short at it. Um, obviously, um, that's why we are working through government and, and we are aware that you know, different agencies like Gavi, other organizations like UPS, have actually come um, to governments to strengthen their cold chain um, capacity equipment. So our vaccines are stored at um, mi mi minus 20 degrees when they come into the country and they can stay there for uh, 24 months. And then when they are taken out, um, they can be stored at two to eight and thawed, they can be stored at two to eight um, for a period of um, 4.5 months. Um, so um that's how we we are working i don't know whether um kashmira has it increased at all right now no okay. so we are looking we are generating more data on the stability profile of the product um at this stage we only have a pool for 4.5 months and we're hoping next year to extend that further um okay. Thank you, Abida. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I I did want to add though, as you said, Linda. I think you know this this does follow the uh, the you know the cold chain uh, general you know the cold chain um, availability in in the country. So it does not require any ultra cold chain or yeah. you know um, that for storage and, and distribution right now. So. Um, uh, you know, there are multiple uh, grants that countries have received through other partners, strengthening their overall cold chain equipment and, and cold chain, um, uh, you know, their overall cold chain mechanisms per se. And so 
we are hoping again, as, as Abira said, that as more thermostability data um, come out, that the recommendations will be appropriately um, revised. Thank you. So the, the other comment that's come in is just that the session has been useful. So let me just, again, take another pause to see if there's any additional questions. Um, if, if you don't want to type in the questions, please just raise your hand and then we can also take your questions uh, in that format. Okay, so it looks like we have come to the end of the session. So again, thank you to everybody, for, to our presenters for taking us through the detailed information, to our participants, appreciate, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good job of chairing the session. I see, a, I see another hand coming up. Um, please, if you can answer, ask your question, the person who's raised their hand, Osborne. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I had actually raised a query concerning um, the modality in which Kenyan government is putting because the other day there was a directive that um, most Kenyans will not be will not be able to access most of the government services because um, if they haven't really gotten the vaccination, that will restrict them. So I wanted to understand, would this really be a very good mitigative measures any other country in Africa would actually employ in terms of reducing, you know, the submissibility of this particular disease? Thank you. Thanks. So I, it, we had a similar question earlier about vaccine mandates and, you know, there's different schools of thoughts of that. I think the first issue is to, to get as many people vaccinated as possible to control the pandemic. And I believe governments are trying their best to get as many people vaccinated. I think following that, the other measures to, is to make sure that people are educated to understand, to make an informed decision about vaccinating and how they can protect themselves and their family. And there is, I mean, a, a research to show that, you know, um, what the impact of vaccine mandates can do to encourage people to get, well, almost ensure that people get vaccinated. But the big question we need to um, address is to, to control the pandemic, we need to have more and more people vaccinated. And governments are trying through either um, providing access, making sure access is accessible, education, and then considering as a last option, vaccine mandates. Um, whether any African countries have done it at this stage, there's none that I know of. I think a lot of countries are considering. In the country I am in South Africa, there has been business has supported it. And some of the trade unions have supported vaccine mandates. Um, we, the, the government is, has set up an uh, advisory committee to review the decision. At this stage, we haven't seen an outcome, but I think as I mentioned earlier, a lot of governments are either considering or planning vaccine mandates to improve vaccination coverage. And Abida, maybe to add to what you've just said, I mean, in Ghana um, for Christmas, a lot of people are coming into the country and what the government has put out is that, you know, if you come to the country and you are not vaccinated, they will offer, you, offer to vaccinate you at the airport. So lots of things are happening, you know, in different countries. I know that in Nigeria as well, they are asking all government workers to be vaccinated by, I think, the end of, of, of December. So um, like Abida said, you know, governments are doing what they, whatever they, they can do to, um, to get people vaccinated. Um, but I think what Abida said, the education um, of the population is very, very critical for people to understand the import of, of this um, and protection of, of communities in general. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Linda. There's a comment in the chat that says, uh, the Zambian Minister of Health has on national TV informed the nation that people who are unvaccinated will not be allowed in public office. So you can see countries are now beginning to make those decisions. And 
we know, you know, with the Omicron um, variant that happened and was discovered by South Africa, many countries closed their borders because of that. And now they're reconsidering that if you do come into the country, you, you would need to be vaccinated. And there's other restrictions that can be in place. Okay. Anybody else would like to either raise the hand or add a comment in the chat? I, I think we have reached the end of the session. So again, thank you to everybody. Um, if we, as I mentioned, we will try and continue the ongoing education of, of um, different stakeholders in the region as new information comes on board and encourage everybody to make sure they, they understand the data to make an informed decision about vaccinations. And we will also make sure we share as much information as becomes available. So appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.